Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for logging in. We're going to give us a couple minutes as the participants, um, the number of participants goes up. We will get started in just a minute. Thank you again for being here. Again, for those of you just joining us, we're just waiting a couple minutes um, as our participant numbers keep increasing on our side, which is a good thing. We will get started in about 30 seconds. All right, it looks like we're holding steady at, oop, 62. <laughs> All right, hello everybody, good evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Tammy Strauss. I am the principal of Newton South High School and welcome to our grade nine family night. We so appreciate the time that you are giving us. Um, we do have some important information to relay to all of you. Um, a couple of things just logistically, if a question does come up, feel free to use the Q&A feature in um, Zoom to ask your question. We will either answer your question, um, if it's an easy one there and there, if it's something that's getting asked repeatedly, we will address it to the whole group, um, but we will do our best to kind of feel that. Um, in addition, um, just so that you all know, I'm hoping that all of you saw my message that was part of Mr. Williams' weekly memo um, under the principal's corner. Unfortunately, our head of counseling, our department chair for counseling, was in a skiing accident and will be out for several weeks. So we do have... Um, uh, his predecessor is actually going is is has come back to help us out. Um, there's a joke at Newton South that you never truly retire from Newton South, and that's exactly what's happening here. Um, so Shelly will be introducing herself um, just so that you all know that we do have the support, and we wish Mr. Rubin the best of luck, and we hope that he is back with us soon. Um, with that, I think that's. All I have to say, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Williams, my vice principal, to do a little introduction for himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, Jason Williams, vice principal here at Newton South. This is my third year as vice principal. Really happy to be here this evening and um, help talk you through some of the things as a ninth grade family you need to know I'm heading into the 10th grade. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shelly. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry it's under the circumstances that exist, um, but I uh, retired from Newton South in 2018. Um, so if you had a child there between 2010 and 2018, we might have met each other. Um, anyway, I hope that in uh, Mr. Rubin's absence, I can um, be able to fill in and help out the department and your kids and the school. So um, I am here. Feel free to reach out to me, um, and um, I will pass the baton off to um, Maggie Schmidt, who's co-president of the PTSO. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me here. And um, Shelly, I want to say a great big welcome back to you. We're grateful to have you be back at our school um, while Dan is recovering. We wish him a speedy recovery. Um, I'm here on behalf of the PTSO. I'm one of the co-presidents this year, myself and Will Adams. I have two kids at South. One's a senior and one's a freshman. So um, we're starting over and we're moving on out. Um, as your PTO co-president, my job is to build community and support our teachers, um, to communicate with you all. And then we raise funds to support all these activities. Um, all parents, all guardians, all students, all faculty at Newton South P um, High School are members of the PTSO. If you are not already signed up for our website, or sorry, excuse me, if you are not already signed up for our newsletter, I encourage you to do that. You can do that from our website. I will post that link in the chat. We send out a Sunday newsletter. Um, we have about a dozen volunteers who help with hospitality, holiday events, website, parent class reps. We're always looking for volunteers, so please watch for emails. This coming spring, as we start to fill roles for next year, we're a pretty active group and we love all the participation we can get. Once we spend all of our um, money through the dues that we collect, we give all the money back to the school through gifts to our departments, um, staff appreciation. We put together a school directory and we help with some you know, administrative expenses on our back end. Um, and if you haven't paid your dues already yet this year, it's not too late. Again, you can do that through our website. 
Um, we encourage everyone to connect with the PTSO. We're here to build community, to promote connections. We love hearing from everyone. So feel free to email us at any time. We love hearing from you. Sorry, I'm supposed to pass it off to Star. Star is here to talk about Gelf. Hi, everybody. My name is Star Lu. I'm um, actually, I'm a, a soon to be Newton South parent. My older one is coming up to Newton South um, next year. So I'm very excited. Um, my other role in the community is that I'm a global program developer. Um, so I coordinate the international exchange programs and the financial aid. Next slide, please, Jason. So the information um, you can find about international travel program is under the, the district website, under departments and programs, or simply Google it. Um, you, uh, Jason, next, please. Just Google international travel program and you're gonna go to this website. Yeah, yeah, next, please. And then next, please. So on the website, you're going to see our current uh, exchange programs uh, for pretty much every language. We have an exchange program or travel program. Uh, I just want to bring it to everybody's attention that the Ghana exchange is going to start up soon. This is our new exchange program. And then we're going to have another exchange program coming up. Uh, Jason, just hit enter, please. I have an animation here. Yeah. So we're going to have a sustainability um, trip coming up very soon. So please also note that the China exchange um, is between Newton North and Newton South. So it's a district wide exchange program and it's four months in China and we host for four months. And um, that is going to resume after pandemic um, this coming September. So as a rising 10th grader, this year is a great year to apply to go to if you are in the Chinese program, you can go to China for four months next year. Thank you. Next, please, Jason. So this is what a website looks like for each exchange program. Next, please. So for some families who are going through family difficulty time, difficult time and couldn't afford international travel program, we also have a financial aid program to support it. It's called the Jennifer Price Global Education Leadership Fund, which is a nonprofit organization. All donations are taxed um, free. Can we go next, please? So this year, I want to um, bring this to everyone's attention that on Thursday, March 28th at Barrymore, which is the restaurant at Newton Center, we're going to have uh, a golf gathering. So uh, this is the chance for parents and community to meet with our trip leaders from both Newton North and Newton South and district wide program. And we ask people to reserve a seat by donating $20. Next, please. Yeah, and next, please. So let's hear from a Newton South student, Kevin Yang. Hello, I'm Kevin Yang. I'm class of 2024, and I was one of the recipients of the GELF grant uh, for the French uh, trip for Newton South High School. And I would like to say that uh, this GELF grant was an opportunity enabler. It, it allowed me to take this trip that I would otherwise not have been able to do. And I think fondly upon this trip, especially with my interactions uh, with the Parisians and, and just being with them and hanging out with them as you know teenagers in, in a big city. I remember playing basketball with them, going to my correspondence basketball practice and, and bonding with other Parisians um, over the sport of basketball. And you know, to be honest, I didn't really understand what, uh, what they were all saying during practice or what all the drills meant. Uh, but just being able to play basketball, shooting hoops, uh, and bonding over that was an experience that you know, otherwise I would not have been able to feel uh, with, without this GELF grant. So I'd like to say that uh, with further donations uh, towards GELF, GELF you're helping uh, students and future generations uh, to become world leaders and to be immersed in other cultures, um, giving them a more nuanced perspective on the world. And next slide, please, Jason. Hello, I'm Kevin. So if you, in order to find GALF information, it's right underneath the International Travel Program tab on our website. Next, please, Jason. 
So here are some pictures from last year's fundraiser. So this year, instead of uh, doing a full-blown fundraiser, which we have done every year, uh, we're going to do a community building connection and uh, gathering. Next slide, please. So here's our principal stress and then some of our community members who are on board. So I want to give a shout out to David Fraser, Song Dae Hong, Jun Liu, Kerry Michael. These are our board members from South and also a Newton South parent, Laura uh, Taveras. Next slide, please, Jason. So she's the one who provided this beautiful place for our golf gathering last year. Next slide, please. So how can you help? Please join, uh, be a board member, or if you would like, also become a, a subcommittee volunteer. Um, we have the following subcommittees for review awards, finance, fundraising events, et such. And I also want to give a shout out to our Newton South PTSO uh, presidents. They have been so supportive of GALF events throughout the years. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, next, please. So if you want to know more information, you could email me, L-E-W-Y, um, and the following Newton email address, or you can follow us on social media. Thank you, everyone, and have a good night. I'm going to introduce uh, Jerry Gagnon, who is the Science and Technology Tech, uh, Tech Ed Department Chair, and Jan Mor Morrow, who is the Social Studies Department Chair. Hi, I'm Jerry Gagnon. I'm the Department Chair of Science, Tech Ed, and Engineering at Newton South High School. Um, and a little bit later in the presentation, I'm going to be talking to you about two different things. Uh, thing one is some of the smaller learning community offerings uh, that will be available to the rising sophomores. And secondarily, I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on with the ninth graders now within science as they prepare for the MCAS exam in June. But for right now, I'm going to turn it over to Jen Morrill. Hi, I'm Jen Morrill, the History Chair, and I guess I'll talk about the smaller learning communities that you can choose that involve history and English. Is this the right time for me to do it, Jason? Should I be doing this now? No, no not yet. yet. Okay, sorry. So I'm Jen Morrill, the History Chair, and I'll be talking to you later about the Global Media Program and uh, New Media Communities. Thank you. And good evening, all. My name is Dave Kershaw. I am one of the counselors in Goodwin House. Uh, wonderful to be here and, and to see all of you uh, joining us. And I'll be speaking a little bit later in the, in the presentation as well. And in the meantime, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Chris Hardin. Thanks, Dave. And uh, my name is Chris Hardiman. This is my 13th year at Newton South. Uh, I am a <clears throat> Golder Coast counselor and I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just an overview, brief overview of the three main themes that we're going to talk about this evening. Um, first, we're going to talk a little bit about the continued adjustment of your students to high school and, and the and transition in general. Um, then we'll be talking about the course registration process, uh, the curriculum options, as we mentioned, the small learning communities. And then uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll be addressing the end of year events, including the science MCAS, as Jerry mentioned, and um, kind of the end of course culminate, culminating experiences. Um, so to start off, um, next slide, please. Um, we just wanna reiterate as we're now more than halfway through ninth grade for your students that um, we expect all students to have an adjustment period in high school. And we also recognize that some students are still adjusting at this point in the year. Um, you know, some, some are coming from Oak Hill and Brown, but we also know some of our students are coming from um, other private schools or from other cities, countries. And uh, we know that it can take time and the adjustment can, can be difficult for some students. We hope that new students have taken advantage of our new to South group that um, one of our counseling colleagues, Cara Vili, runs. Um, that's been happening on Fridays during wind block. It's a great place for students to feel that affinity, anyone that's new to Newton. Um, so that's been, that's one program that we have uh, in place. Um, our hope is that students have hope, get, gotten involved in at least one activity by now at this point, whether it be the, uh, the ninth grade play 
back in the fall, um, a club. I'm actually the club coordinator for the school as well. And we have uh, well over 120 clubs, which is, is more than a lot of uh, some colleges have actually. So um, we have many, many variety of, of options for students in terms of clubs. Um, musical groups, uh, affinity groups, we, we have, part of our club culture is also having these affinity groups where students can feel um, connected, whether it be through, um, you know, uh, whether it's a cultural group, uh, religious group, uh, it could be uh, a racial uh, affinity group. We have many, many options for students. And we always have students wanting to start new clubs and start new affinity groups. And um, that happens in September. So if your student has not started, uh, has an interest in starting a new club, but they, they would like to do so in the future, they can uh, look for information from me in uh, September. Um, we also just wanna normalize that, um, you know, change and, and being flexible is important for, um, for high school students. They're a little bit older than they were uh, obviously in middle school and we want them to, to kind of adapt with uh, a new environment. They don't have necessarily the team structure that they had in middle school. And there are a lot of different teachers that they're getting to know and, and get comfortable with. Um, so we always just re reiterate that as well. Um, we're also encouraging students to especially as they get to be second semester ninth graders and moving into 10th grade, that they um, advocate for themselves. Um, we, we're aware that some students are better that, at that than others at this point in their um, high school career, but we are always encouraging as counselors and, and, and teachers and, and a staff, um, encouraging students to advocate and uh, ask for help, whether it's asking uh, help from a teacher or whether it's uh, setting up an appointment with with us, uh, their school counselors. Um, we really, really kind of um, push that self-advocacy piece um, and developing coping mechanisms as well to deal with stress, to deal with peer issues, um, you know, whatever the, the stressor might be for, for students, we're always um, encouraging and working with them on uh, developing those self-advocacy skills. So um, next slide, please. Um, getting connected, I, I talked a little bit about that already with, with the club piece, um, but at this point in year, the year, if you have not asked your student, uh, it may be a good time to ask them, where is the place that they go uh, in our school if they're having a difficult time? Or, just in general, where do they go to feel connected, the most connected? Is it a particular space uh, or community in the school? Um, it could be the art room. Actually, I know a lot of students who uh, just adore our, our um, art and music teachers and, and find that to be a very kind of uh, safe, comforting place. Um, theater, like I said, athletic teams. Lots of our ninth graders have, have joined um, the, the various athletic groups. We also have uh, some non-MIAA-sponsored uh, clubs that, that are sports, whether it be badminton, uh, we have a volleyball club, we have a um, flag football, and we're about to have uh, a uh, ultimate Frisbee team as well. So great, great opportunities for activities that involve uh, sports that are non-competitive um, or non you know, the pressure of being, making a team, that sort of thing. Um, so the other piece that is mentioned always at the beginning of the year, you probably heard this, is we want students to feel like there's at least one adult in the building that they uh, feel like they can go to and that they're connected to. And I say at least because hopefully by now your student has more than one. Um, but even if if they don't, you know, one is is better than having no one. So we really want every student in our school to feel like there's someone that they can go to. Um, we hope it's it's us as school counselors, um, but we know that sometimes it can take a while to get to know us. Um, we do have individual meetings with our ninth graders in addition to seminars, um, but the most important thing is that they're um, connected and that they're accessing the supports. Um, so speaking of 
connection, we just wanted to reemphasize the, the role of the high school counselor. Uh, we help students navigate the multiple demands, uh, whether it be uh, balance of schedule, time management, uh, between their academic and extracurricular outside of school activities. We also really importantly provide a space for emotional connection, a, a safe space, listening without judgment, offering advice whenever we can, uh, collaborative problem solving. Unlike middle school, we, we really do want the high school student to, to partner with us and not just have us be the one coming up with the solution, of course, but having it be collaborative. Um, and we do talk with students at any point uh, if they're having issues with peers, could be siblings uh, advocating with a teacher if there are um, conflicts happening, uh, maybe a, a concern about a grade that they're getting in a class. Uh, the school counselor, that's, that's a big part of our role is helping students navigate through that. We also want to partner with you as caregivers. If you have any concerns about your student, uh, as I had mentioned, if they're not connecting with adults or they're not connecting with peers, uh, or if there's a change in affect or mood that you notice is different than what you, you're used to with your, your student, please reach out to your student's counselor um, and, and or dean. Um, I haven't mentioned the deans of students, but they are wonderful, wonderful resources in the house. And, um, and we can discreetly meet with your student to help in any way. Or we can also provide outside resources to your student and or to you as their caregivers. So, uh, and then finally, we do spend time more in from 10th grade on talking with students about, uh, you know, career and, and, and certainly college. Um, for a lot of our students plan to go to college after high school. We don't spend a lot of time in ninth grade talking about that, but I just did want to make, uh, put a plug in for our college and career counselor, Kathy Sabet. She's a amazing resource in the school. She does not have a caseload of her own, but she's here to support students and families with um, uh, not just the college piece, but getting, uh, helping to get a job, internships. She has information on, um, you know, uh, essay writing, interview skills, resume writing, things like that. So uh, she's a wonderful resource. So just wanted to, to mention her at this point. And with that, uh, next slide, and we're going to turn it over back to Dave Kershaw. Thank you, Chris. Uh, welcome, everyone. As I said, it's wonderful to see you all here. We know that uh, the transition to uh, freshman year is a is a significant thing. It can be a significant thing for for you know many members, all members of the family, not just freshmen. Um, so, uh, congrats on getting almost three quarters of the way through freshman year. It's hard to believe we're there already. Uh, we hope at this point you have seen. I'm going to talk a little bit about academic resources, but we hope we hope at this point you have seen that we really pride ourselves on having as much wraparound support as we possibly can in collaboration with students students uh, and families. And I think um, a big way we do that is supporting students. Obviously, a big, the biggest part of their work at South and their time at South is academics and working uh, working on school. And I think um, when they're having struggles or, you know, and, and obviously we're celebrating the wins as well, but uh, we pride ourselves on, on really understanding when there's, there's struggle happening and, and identifying that, especially for such a large school. So some of the ways we do that is we um, have created with the, with the, you know, onset of our new schedule a few years ago, we built wind blocks into uh, into our week. So we actually carved out time. We noticed there was you know a lack of, of face time in terms of teachers having just physical time in the day to, to connect with students. And this the wind block additions have been a huge win for us in terms of, no pun intended, but in terms of getting that time with students. So it's been really wonderful. It's built into the week. It's an opportunity for them to sign up um, through MyFlex Learning to be able to access teachers, but also access um, clubs, um, social groups, things like that. So it's a really universal way that we um, allow students to stretch beyond just the classroom and, and really understand more about themselves as a learner and about as an, and, uh, as an individual. Um, we have specific um, academic support centers that can help students with with content specific, um, you know, questions and, and reinforcement and things like that. Um, specifically, the math center and the writing center are two disciplines that we have um, dedicated spaces in um, 
in the building for where um, it's staffed, they're staffed most of the day, um, their schedules posted, you know, there's a lot of communication around when they can get support. It's another set of eyes and ears for a writing assignment, for example, somebody neutral that isn't your teacher or parent, um, things like that. So just getting a little bit of help with editing. Um, and the math center is a huge, um, a huge opportunity for students to, to, again, access somebody that's not their teacher. Um, we have a wonderful um, retired engineer, Mr. Marchica, who staffs the math center most of the day. Um, and he's wonderful student Students really uh, you know, have amazing things to say about the way he helps them learn um, and just reinforce concepts in math. Uh, our academic um, support center is, is is something that's been developed again out of our uh, out of our want and need to to target students that who were showing us that they they may be struggling in certain areas so teachers were noticing that and then alerting counselors we have a universal approach where um, they may alert us to that um, and then we recommend a program a, a something built into the day called small study. So it's it's not a directed study. It's not a study hall. It's a small study where they're getting um, support. It's, it's, um, it's staffed. There's some staff there that has the ability to, there's an administrative staff that has the ability to, teachers can funnel work there, a test or a quiz that needs to be made up, things like that. Um, if they if students benefit from, from doing that in a smaller, more quiet space, that's what small stud studies do. They're really capped at about eight or nine students. So it's really a, um, there's also an, a, an academic teacher there. They may not be their student specific academic teacher, but there's also an academic teacher there as well. So a great opportunity um, when students are struggling to, to, to you know, target that um, and use that resource in the building. And then we also have peer tutoring. We found a wonderful way for students to connect with material sometimes is through a peer who has, who maybe has um, seen them, who has seen the material before, um, had a lot of success with it and the department heads partner with them um, and, and pair them up with students who, who may need support in a certain subject. Um, that's a wonderful tool as well. Uh, next slide, Jason, please. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the social emotional resources. Obviously, that was pretty academic heavy, the pre pre prior slide, but we hope there's all there's a symbiosis going on in terms of understanding yourself as an individual as well outside the classroom. And, and we do a lot of work with that. There's a lot of development, as you all know, that happens in those in the four years that students are with us in high school, a lot of brain brain, brain development and uh, just a lot of changes that happen. And we hope that we're partnering with with you and students during that in providing these social emotional resources. So obviously we as counselors are, we view as a really big part of that. Um, we do a lot of outreach initially and in getting to know students um, with one-to-one -one meetings. Um, we also have an amazing team of school adjustment counselors, um, specifically uh, Brian Dulesky and Nicole Motley, who are our team who sees, um, you know, a whole host of students, you know, both through a referral um, and just, you know, helping students with issues that may come up that, you know, that we know that, you know, it's school and home or there's not a dividing line. Sometimes, you know, there's, there's, there's issues that kind of cross over and uh, we find it really helpful for students to have that, that, you know, set time to, to meet with those individuals. Um, so we have that as an opportunity for them. Um, we also have uh, many guidance seminars throughout the year that are targeted toward, um, specific content but really they're an opportunity for us to get to, um you know to create that community space and create that relationship as chris was talking about earlier with counselor and and student right and just so they can all a lot of times especially to be together and understand that they're going through the same thing at the same time they're transitioning to high school together they have questions if they're upperclassmen they have questions about the the post-secondary process things like that that's a lot of the reason for the seminars to, to make sure that we all get in one spot because it can get busy um those are a lot of social there's a lot of sel which is social emotional learning um, themed into the into wind blocks as well so we have those wind block opportunities for us um, where teachers are seeing students for content related things we're seeing them more for social emotional learning um, topics that can come up so we can carve those out into our into wind blocks um, one of our colleagues has an executive functioning uh, group for example so there's a whole host of opportunities where we've where we've earmarked for social emotional learning themes during wind block as well so that's another way we help students develop social emotional wise um, and then we also have uh, counseling groups that, you know, psychoeducational groups that we um, we really try to promote. Uh, we have a an amazing resource that our principal Strauss um, really prioritized in, in her first year here. Um, it's called the Counseling Center. It's one of our bigger spaces in the building. It used to it used to just be a study hall space. It's it's at the end of the Goodwin Hallway, but we um, principal Strauss sort of partnered with our our. Um, social workers and the, and the counseling team and dedicated space to um, put some comfortable furniture in there and, and really make it a place where students can gather and get support. We have, stu we have um, 
uh, stress less groups in there where students students can go debrief, uh, you know, just kind of de decompress. There's uh, coloring, there's puzzles. Uh, we have some Zen music going in there a lot of times. Uh, we run groups throughout the year as well, um, both with counselors and um, school adjustment counselors and social workers. Um, and it's just a wonderful quiet space where we've um, you know, shown the community that we prior that we're really trying to prioritize um, uh, mental health wellness, and I think that's and, and students have seen that. We're going to continue to grow that initiative. Uh, it's something that students have to sort of wrap around to and, and sort of see that it's a culture shift in terms of having that be part of a space at school that's that they should feel comfortable accessing, and that's that's a that's work that we continue to do. Um, but it's been wonderful to have that, and we really really appreciate it. It's a very valuable space. So, um, and then uh, Chris. Um, alluded to earlier, we have affinity groups and spaces as well, um, where students can access, um, you know, like-minded individuals who want to, um, you know, connect with each other and, and have opportunities to, um, to, to, to work on issues and to just be together socially too, um, with people who, uh, who they feel most comfortable with. And that's a really important thing. We never want students to feel isolated in our building. They, you know, it has to feel like home and, and it is your academic home. And that's something we promote, uh, widely. So, um. And with that, um, I'm going to kick it over to Chris to talk a little bit about course registration. Thanks, Dave. Um, just a, a quick overview on this, and then we'll get pass it off um, to Jen related to the small learning communities. But just a, an overview that not 10th graders do have more options um, for curriculum lanes. So uh, not just in math, but uh, in other subjects, we have college prep, advanced college prep, and, and honors. So, so that is something different than um, the ninth grade. Um, and teachers do have very um, uh, pretty pointed conversations and, and careful conversations with students about uh, what level, or, you know, lane might be most appropriate for that student. Um, that those conversations are happening now uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, there is a wider and deeper choice of electives. Uh, for example, their students have to start in art courses um, and a foundations, but then once they get to 10th grade and beyond, they can really expand into more advanced uh, art classes, music classes, uh, uh, you know, different, lo lots of different categories, uh, cooking classes and tech ed. Um, it runs the gamut. We have such a diverse group of electives for students and there are even more choices for 10th graders than there are for ninth graders. So uh, your students will be going through that process. Uh, I believe in two weeks from now, they their window for will be open um, and uh, there'll be more information on that from Jason in a couple of minutes. Uh, counselors will be meeting with all ninth graders a little later in March to talk about the, the big picture of all their courses in emphasizing balance. We put it with an exclamation point because sometimes students don't see the, the big picture and they're just looking at what the teachers are recommending, but we really uh, see the importance of talking with students about not trying to fill up every moment to try to achieve heights that may not be realistic or attainable. Um, and so we do talk about what's where does a student find from fulfillment, the most fulfillment, and which courses, uh, which ones do they think they're going to enjoy the most, and uh, uh, you know which what kind of balance is going to be important for that student. And it does sometimes really differ from each student to student. Some students have very busy uh, extracurricular lives, and so we want to tell those students and and guide them to choices where they're not going to be overwhelmed with their course load in addition to their extracurricular um, uh, load outside of school. So we have very careful conversations about those things with your students and they'll be happening in the next few weeks. So with that, I'll turn it over to, I think it's Jen or Jerry. Or... Hello Jen. everyone, welcome. Um, it's so nice to not see you, but know that you're there. And congratulations on your kids being through a great, you know, a large part of their first year at Newton South High School. It's an exciting time for students to choose courses next year. Um, and I would say I'll represent all the chairs by saying that the teachers really work hard to help the students make a good choice. 
But if your student has any concerns about the recommendations, the first thing to do is to really help your student talk with the teacher. That's a really great opportunity to teach, to help young people learn how to advocate for themselves and to ask questions. If you have questions after that, then of course you should talk to the teacher. And if you still don't have your questions answered, the chairs are always happy to, um, to talk with you. So it's important at the end of the day that people's questions have been answered and that everyone feels like the decisions being made are really gonna set the student up for a good year. Smaller learning communities are just that. There's, there's smaller, there's an option in history and English to do linked classes. And Jerry Gagnon will talk about math and science in a minute. But the idea is we have a very big high school. And for some kids that um, that's exciting to be in this big school and to go to different classes with lots of different kids and to have that kind of schedule. For some students, that big school can feel a little overwhelming and it can be really a wonderful experience to be in a linked class. So um, in, and I wanna emphasize that the curriculum is very similar in all the classes. So it's not that students are learning special or different history or English, for example, is that the focus is on the smaller learning community. So in English and history, students have a choice to do something called new media communities or global history. And both of, in both of those situations, the kids will be with the same students in their history and English class. So they'll have two classes in which they have the exact same students. The teachers work together to create some linked projects or opportunities. They're, they're creating a community around the focus of that class. New Media Communities is focused on kids showing their understanding of history and English through media other than just writing an essay. So students will learn to write in all of our courses, but in new media, they might make a podcast or a documentary. Um, and they might be learning their history in English you know, through some of those sources as well. So it's focused on using new media um, to both learn about and convey their understanding of the content. Global Communities is, is a program that is focused on social justice and is about creating a linked community. Global and new media both begin sophomore year and go through junior year, and there are some senior courses that are linked. Students aren't locked in, so if they choose to try one of these programs in the sophomore year, they can opt out of it junior year. However, we really don't want students to opt out of it sophomore year. So if a student tries new media or global, at the end of the day, it's just their English and history class. And so we would ask that they see it through for the full year. Um, Jerry, would you like to talk about Da Vinci? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, the Da Vinci program is a STEAM program in that it incorporates both science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics um, all in one program. And it starts, as uh, Jen mentioned, in 10th grade, and it is a smaller learning community. Um, so uh, the Da Vinci program um, hasn't been a long, around quite as long as the global program, but it's been a profound, it's, it's had a profound impact on the kids who have, uh, have availed themselves of the opportunity. Um, it allows them to kind of demonstrate their learning in a slightly different way. It's a little bit more project-based. And again, there's integration between math and science. The kids still do chemistry in 10th grade and biology in 11th grade, but uh, that integration in the smaller learning community component is different. Um, because it is a STEAM program and not just a STEM pro program, we do expect that kids will have um, had some exposure to art, either by taking a ninth grade uh, art elective or by doing the same in 10th grade. Um, and then if they continue into 11th grade, as we hope they will, there's an engineering course that comes along in the second half of the year, which is, again, integrated with the other two courses. Um, and in senior year, there's a capstone experience where kids get to really own their learning in a profound way. Um, and I think that the, the kids have uh, who have done this program, the Da Vinci program, oftentimes one of the worries that I heard from them when they were deciding was, will I still have access to, to be able to take that upper level AP or advanced class as a senior in math or in science? And the answer is absolutely. Um, I can tell you that last year as a teacher of AP physics, I had a whole bunch of kids who had come through the Da Vinci program. And I can tell you that their collaboration skills were off the charts, um, which is ag absolutely what we're hoping for um, as we, we try to launch kids off uh, to college and beyond, that they've build the, built those skills and they can uh, call upon them um, you know, the things that they've honed at Newton South so that they can have success 
uh, beyond Newton South. Excellent. So I'll pass it back over to Chris, I believe. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, we're going to go right into the registration timeline, and that will be uh, Jason Williams. Hi, everybody. Just uh, talking about the registration timeline really quick. Um, so there are four phases overall to the registration uh, process. The first phase is where teachers will recommend courses to students, um, which they will work with uh, their they will work with students around January to February. And then we have a window that was actually opened up yesterday where they'll be inputting those into Aspen. The second phase is the phase where students get to request additional courses in Aspen that don't require a teacher recommendation or any electives. Um, that will start on March 12th. And then uh, during that window is also when uh, but students will start to meet with their counselors one-on-one -on -one week by week, which I believe either Chris or Dave will go over to in a little bit more detail. And then the whole process ends with uh, something called verification. Typically, this is on a Monday because we have a special Monday advisory for it. We still will, but this um, because this date pushed back a little bit, um, there, our last day is actually not going to be a Monday this year, but just as a uh, technical piece. Um, for the program of studies, it was posted online yesterday, so it's officially ready. Um, I did learn that S'more was doing very weird things yesterday. So um, a ninth grader came up and talked to me about it, and one parent emailed me as well. So thank you to both of them for that. But there was a weird thing going on where like people tried to click the links in the S'more I sent out yesterday evening, and like it just took me took you back to the S'more login. And I remember being like, wait a minute, this can't be true. And then I tried it, and I was like, wait a minute, this is happening to me too. It see I just tried it a second ago and it seems like it's fine now. So hopefully you're able to click through those. But um, it's also available on the school's website at this point, so you can peruse the um program from there. Uh, so as we are as I already mentioned, from the February 26th to March 11th window, um, teachers are going to be putting their course recommendations in Aspen. So again, they're working on that now. And then between March 12th and 20th, students are then going to more or less do the same thing. They will be able to see those core course selections that teachers made during this current two-week period. So they'll be able to see what that looks like. And that will be something that counselors will be talking to them about as well. And that's where the whole balance thing um, starts to kick in and everything else. Um, for So again, we've talked about this part, but I'm going to, I think I'm handing over to Dave in just a second, but I actually changed this slide and forgot to like turn this off and turn this back on. But April 4th is really just the last day for any course changes to go in, because essentially what happens at that at this point, at that point is we have to start um, running our own tallies, figuring out how much of each class we're supposed to run. It does have effects on staffing and so on and so forth. So it is really important that once we get to that April 4th point that folks generally know what they want to do when we're done with it, because it's really hard to make changes after that, because we have to more or less plan everything for next year based on what people tell us now. So it's just really important to note that that is really the end all be all red light period, barring like a extenuating circumstance slash emergency. And I forget whether I'm passing it over to Chris or Dave at this point to talk about the rest of this slide. I think it's coming to me. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the timeline in terms of uh, the next steps after what Jason had just talked about. Um, can you just kick that to the nope we were in the perfect this is a perfect slide um sorry uh so essentially march 12th after the teachers have had an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conferences with uh and in, in discussions with students they are going to meet with counselors from a window from march 12th to april 4th uh that's an opportunity we try to do that as much as possible for us to yes certainly talk about the all-important scheduling process and make sure that everything is tight and right with their schedule and that it looks the way they hope it, it would uh, in the fall, but it's really an opportunity for also for us to get to know them, especially as freshmen, a little bit more about their thinking along the lines of their academics, um, how they came to the decisions, how they're feeling about the, the year that they've had and the year ahead, things like that. So that's a wonderful opportunity. And, and so we, we uh, you know, earmark, uh, we'll reach out to counselors, reach out to students individually, and we'll invite them to make appointments one by one um, throughout that throughout that period from March 12th to April 4th. Um, on April 4th, we have verification day. So essentially that's, we've had an opportunity, you've, you've had opportunities to meet with your teacher individually. You've met with your counselor to, to make sure that things are looking as they should. And, and you, you know, there's no more questions. You're feeling like things are really good. So verification day is an opportunity where uh, you're going to have one last look at 
uh, all of those recommendations, any changes that have happened with counselors, uh, and then teachers are going to all everyone's going to agree and verify that there's no more touches on the on this on the schedule, and that we can then hand it off and start building the scheduling process. So the sort of the window is closed in terms of making changes at that point. Um, so really important things to consider during this timeline are graduation requirements. Obviously, uh, we just highlighted some some of the more important ones, but there's a lot of factors to think about. Um, in terms of graduation requirements. So, you know, that's something that you don't have to overthink too much. Counselors are watching that, making sure that you're hitting all of those graduation requirements in just so your overall credits in terms of your 243 credits needed to graduate, but then also the distribution credits you need within that in uh, the academic disciplines and also extracurriculars, um, electives, things like that. So you need to, to hit all of those. And, and generally as taking a full breadth of courses and a full course load each year itself, you will hit well above the 243 credit mark. So it's not something you have to be urgently, you know, worried about, um, but you do, but it's something counselors talk about in those meetings. So that's um, making sure there's sufficient credit. So that's important to make sure that you're taking enough. Um, it's not usually an issue with, with underclassmen, but as upperclassmen move forward, they have different things that they're looking to do. Um, so we look, we target that 72 um, minimum in terms of the credits that they're, the credit load they're taking for the year at a maximum of 84. Um, Obviously, it's an individual decision, but based on preference um, and need um, and how much time you need during the day to get things done and what your balance of, of you know, academics to extracurriculars are outside, there's a whole host and it's very individual. Um, uh, very important to consider alternate choices for electives. Unfortunately, we are we are a really large high school who cannot, as much as we try, um, find the perfect constellation of, of classes for every student. So uh, we want students to choose secondary electives to make sure that if they not they're not able to get their first first choice as hard as we will try to do that, uh, it kicks over to something that they really would like secondarily, right, and not just a random course. So uh, really important to spend time doing that. A lot of times, kids are like you know stuck on one thing and they don't even want to consider a secondary elective. It's it's like, nope, I want this. So I won't, I'm not even going to consider putting alternatives in there. If they don't do that, they're going to find they may be locked out of some courses and then have, have little options beyond that. So really spending time to pick uh, your top two uh, or even three in some cases is super helpful. Um, obviously, you want to focus on interest areas. Uh, that may not be always possible, but we have, as Jason alluded to, uh, one of the a really diverse um, uh, program of study. So there's a lot of opportunity for students to take things that are interesting to them. Uh, and most importantly is obviously balance, right? We talk about things you do outside of school, in school, making sure that you're not overtaxing. Um, and I think that's really important to consider um, and really should be a family decision. Uh, that's important to, to make sure that they, that your students are looping you into that. Um, the discussions that are happening at school and what their thinking is and how much you feel that they're capable of and want to do versus, you know, what, uh, you know, what's doable. Um, I think we can kick to the next slide, Jason. Um, and uh, the additional considerations are strength of schedule. Obviously, um, if you are, you know, looking to attend, you know, looking forward to attend a two or four year college beyond high school and, and continuing your studies, uh, you want a rigorous, uh, you know, course load and you want to be taking, you know, challenge yourself as much as you can. Uh, the reason we say this is double edged sword, because sometimes you can over challenge yourself and you're not leaving enough time um, for the things we ta I talked about and alluded to earlier, like self discovery and um, things that make you laugh and, you know, things that things that bring you joy in your life, whether it's spending time with family, having some downtime to go grab dinner with friends, like, you know, do things that are just are fun and developmentally um, just right on par with where you should be instead of just focusing on what you believe colleges would like to see on a transcript. That's really, uh, you know, a kind of linear way of thinking of it. It's extremely important, of course, but we also want students to be to, to be considering their, their, their mental health, their emotional and physical health as well. So really important to consider that in terms of strength of schedule. And that can, can be a really helpful conversation to have with counselors. What looks good? What doesn't in terms of overloading myself, right? Planning time for joy, we touched on that. Peer pressure is a really, it's a real thing at every school and at every age at this point. But academically, I feel like it's really, uh, the heat has been turned up on this over the past four or five years. So there's a lot of, what are you taking? What are you taking? And I think it's important to make sure that you, um, you know, provide uh, some, some grounding language to, to students at home with that, um, to trust in who they are, trust in the foundation that they build, trust in the work that they do, um, and that it doesn't, you know, they're not the sum of what they're friends may be taking or not taking. Um, they're the sum of what they do individually as a student and as a human being. And um, they don't give themselves enough credit because they all do amazing things. So don't try not to lean into, I'm not taking enough, you know, honors courses. And, you know, my friends I eat lunch with are taking four or three or whatever the case may be. And I'm feeling like I'm, I'm not, you know, hitting the mark. Um, really important. And we work on that with them as well. Um, 
depth versus breadth. So obviously, you know, not just a an academic focus, making sure that you're trying new things, um, trying things in the science and tech um, areas. We have business, we have, you know, glass, we have glass blowing, we have ceramics. There's a million different things that students can do um, to really help stretch themselves a little bit beyond what their comfort level may be. Um, and focus on the why, why are you taking things? What are important to you? What's, you know, what's kind of what really gets you excited about coming to school and learning every day. And there's so many things that can be found in there that are, you know, well beyond just the the you know five six majors that they may be looking at so that's really important um all right and i think next is um jason yep so i'm gonna uh, uh start to talk about some well two more things one being um mcas and some of the things involved with that and um also there's a couple of end of year events i guess want to also bring to your attention so for this uh next slide here um, I'll start talking about the test details and I'll hand it over to Jerry in just a second to talk about um, the science test in particular. But just to go over really briefly in general, um, the high school testing, the high school state test, um, the, the um, students will take science in the for the first time in the ninth grade in June. Um, so it's the first week of June. They'll take either physics or biology. Um, they'll take ELA in March of the 10th grade year. So we're actually getting ready for that in a month for our current sophomore. So that will be um, your students next year. And then they take math in May of grade 10. So they have to pass each of those three tests to graduate. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Jerry to talk a little bit more about the science test in particular. Thanks, Jason. So um, our ninth graders uh, start with physics at Newton South High School. And... Um, Almost 100% of the students, uh, when they sit for the MCAS exam, pass that exam the first time. Um, the, the physics curriculum in all of the courses and physics and engineering projects or just straight physics, and regardless of level, they're really well aligned to the state frameworks, which is, of course, what the uh, exam is based on. So the students go into that exam very well prepared. The physics teachers spend time reviewing the material and also reviewing the test-taking techniques. Um, and in the fourth term, all of the physics teachers run an extra wind block where students uh, who need a little bit of additional support can drop in and get that support so that they'll go into the exam in June well prepared and nice and confident. Um, if they do not pass that first time for whatever reason, there are lots of other pathways that we can take, including uh, taking the biology MCAS exam as juniors, um, submitting cohort appeals and portfolio appeals. And again, it's very unusual that we uh, that we have to go through those different uh, options, but they are there again to support kids uh, um, who, for whatever reason, they did not succeed at the MCAS exam the first time. If you have any questions uh, or your student has any questions about that, they're all always welcome to speak to their physics teacher or to me um, and they can stop by my office or send me an email. And uh, regarding, thank you, Jerry, and regarding the, um, you know, science test in particular, once we get closer to um, that time window in June, you'll see like a special update and weekly update regarding that. You'll also see a special update regarding, um, you know, things to do to be ready for that test and um, so on and so forth. So uh, a couple of things um, regarding like how MCAS works here. We actually um, more or less stop the whole school day for it when we do it. And even though your students aren't going to be taking the um, ELA and math tests in March and May, you will actually get to experience this twice. So um, once we, when we have one of the big MCASs, only, we only have students who are taking the test in the building in the morning. So we're going to run a very special schedule. There's, it's basically going to take up like half the weekly update that week. So I promise you, you won't miss it as long as you read them. Please read them. Um, but the test takers will come in the morning and all our students will come to school later in the school day. So you'll see that schedule. The bus schedule will be changed, all that jazz. I'll go into details with that in the update later. Um, once the students do, once everyone else does come back to school, we do run a reduced modified class schedule. And I think it's a really good structure to make it so that, you know, it's only the students in the building. You're only focused on taking the test. You're not going to be late for anything or anything like that because everyone here is only doing um, that one thing. Note that uh, students do have to use school issued Chromebooks to test. So um, all of your students should have gotten a Chromebook at some point. Um, there always are some kind of cases where like for some reason the student may not have gotten one for one reason or another. We do have some loaner Chromebooks as well. Um, 
but we only have a limited number of them. So if you do have, if your student does have a Chromebook, um, which again, generally speaking, they should, um, please make sure that they bring that for the, for that test. Um, and there's going to be certain, you know, rules in terms of like what version of Chrome it has to have and so on and so forth. But again, th those are um, minutia that we'll talk about as we get much closer um, to that date. The uh, last thing I just want to mention here before we open up to any like last questions for a couple of minutes is there's a couple of end of year uh, events that are that are worth mentioning here. One is on April 27th, there will be a uh, grade nine event that the class officers and the class advisors are working on. It should be at set from seven to 10, that's PM at South. Um, I should have written PM there. And then also just note that like, we're going to have our final schedule of sorts um, in that week of June 17th. We're still working on that schedule and pulling that together, but we just want to give you a heads up that that is when um, that will happen. So I believe that's the um, end of our regularly scheduled presentation. I, we can hold up for a minute or two to see if there are are any other questions that folks have based on anything we presented? I know it's a lot of information in the past, like 57 minutes or so, but, or I can hand it back to you, Tammy, and we can determine what makes the most sense. Yeah. I mean, I'm not seeing any questions come in. So at this point, I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here. Um, and, and like Jason said, we just threw a lot of information at you. And if none of it makes sense, that's okay. Um, reach out to your child's counselor, your child's dean, a department head. If you have questions that are academic related, Mr. Williams, myself, we are here to help you. Um, and we're here to ensure that the rest of your child's experience at South is a positive one and hopefully has been a positive one up until this point. So again, Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of my panelists who gave up an hour of their evenings to be here. I appreciate that more than you know. Um, and we'll see you all later. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.